Hey there, visual economic viewers. Let me ask you a question. At a time when the price of gasoline is skyrocketing, when pollution has become an increasingly important concern for many, and when overwhelming traffic in the cities makes us stress day in and day out, we are all concerned, right? So what solutions can you think of to tackle all of these problems? Well, I am sure, absolutely certain, that there are many of you who have thought at some point that the answer lies in public transportation. After all, this type of transport saves fuel, reduces pollution, and above all, reduces traffic congestion in large cities. Now, if we want to promote public transport, what is the best way to do it? Well, many politicians are clear about that. The best method, the definitive formula, is to subsidize its use until it is completely free. Free public transport gains traction in Europe. Luxembourg prides itself in being the first country in the world to offer nationwide free public transport. Since March the 1st, no one needs to buy a ticket to use the country's public transport network. Think about it. Completely free public transport would not only be a great option for promoting its use, but would also allow people with fewer resources to access a cheap and safe means of transport while increasing their purchasing power especially at a time when the price of fuel has skyrocketed, making private transportation even more expensive than normal. So in theory, I don't know, not only does it seem like a good measure, but this would also be an ideal time to adopt it, don't you think? Well, visual economic viewers, hold on just one moment, because I'm afraid we might be jumping to conclusions here. What if I told you that making public transport free of charge is not as good an idea as it seems? What if I told you that it neither favors the poor nor helps to fight pollution or congestion? What if I told you that this measure could even aggravate inflation instead of reducing it? Yes, you heard me correctly. As so often happens in the world of economics, a measure that looks very good at first glance can have a much more negative effect on closer inspection. But unlike what happens in the world of politics, in economics, data and evidence rule. And I regret to tell you that in this case, everything indicates that offering public transportation at zero cost might not be such a good idea. Now, the question is, why? What is wrong with offering this type of public service for free or for very cheap? Well, today on Visual Economic, we're going to tell you all about it. So let's get cracking. As we have seen at the beginning of this video, many cities around the world are making public transport free of charge. For instance, one of the pioneers was Tallinn, the capital of Estonia, in 2014. Economists have since investigated the results of this measure. And do you know what they found? Well, at first glance, nothing surprising. As everyone expected, when public transport became cheaper, the use of public transport increased by 3% after three weeks and 14% one year later. A little later on, and in comparison to what happened in Estonia, researchers in Chile decided to carry out a similar experiment. That experiment consisted of selecting two two groups of people, one group that was given free transportation voucher and another group that was given nothing. Again, as we can imagine, the people in the group with the free transport voucher increased their use of public transport by 10% in just two weeks, which, by the way, had an effect three times more intense than in the Estonian case. So the conclusion seemed obvious. It was an irrefutable reality that making transport free of charge considerably increased its use. So then, what's the problem? Why do we here on Visual Economics say that free might not be a good idea? Where are these studies wrong? Well, pay attention because this is where the most curious part of the matter begins. How much or when? Please take note here that at no time have we said that free public transport does not serve to increase the use of public transport. What we have said is that it does not serve to meet objectives such as reducing emissions, reducing congestion, or alleviating inflation. However, how is it possible that if the use of public transport increases, all of these objectives will not be met? Well, to know the answer, we have to go back to the study in Chile. As we have said, in the Chilean experiment, those people who had free access to public transport increased their trips by 10%. This was learned because the researchers kept a rigorous record of each and every movement made by the people in the experiment. However, do you know what else the researchers found in those records? The vast majority of the times that people used their travel vouchers were to travel at off-peak times. The study found that the voucher boosted public transport only during non-working hours, specifically 23%, while during working hours, everything basically remained the same. And pay attention, because it doesn't end there. Another interesting finding was that this increase in off-peak public transport use was not in substitution for automobile use, but rather in substitution for walking trips or trips that simply would not have happened. As if people had only taken advantage of the free transport to avoid walking for a while. In short, the researchers' conclusion was that free public transport did not serve to combat the use of private vehicles. This in turn meant that it did not help to curb pollution, reduce fuel consumption, or alleviate congestion in the city. At best, it served to lighten people's downtime at relative low demand times. 
But okay, after seeing the results of this study, I know what many of you are thinking. Come on, come on. One study is not proof of anything. The world is very diverse and every city is different. But what happens is that in the economic literature, the results of the various experiments that have been carried out all seem to go along exactly the same lines. To mention some more, in the three analyses conducted between 1996 and 2017, several economists found that a 10% lowering of the cost of public transport was only able to reduce private vehicle use to between 0.17 and 1.3%. So basically, it did very little. But be that as it may, this raises new questions. How is it possible that even when transport is made free of charge, people do not react and continue to prefer private transport? What can be done to encourage the use of public transport if making it free of charge is not enough? Well, let's see the answers. Money is not everything. First of all, let's answer the key question. Why on earth didn't the citizens in the different studies jump at the chance to use public transport when it became free, thus substituting the use of their cars? Well, the truth is that part of the answer is much simpler than we might think. Public transport is usually already heavily subsidized. That is, governments usually set prices that are already pretty cheap. In this way, making it even cheaper or making it free does not make such a big change as to revolutionize consumption patterns. However, there are also more reasons to explain this phenomenon. For example, in the Chilean study, they found that the people who used the free transportation voucher, the most were neither the poorest, nor the youngest, nor the oldest. Rather, they were simply those who lived closest to the metro or bus stations. To give you an idea, people living less than one kilometer from a public transport station or stop even doubled their use of the services compared to people living further from a station. So how can this be explained? Well, it's explained by the generalized cost theory, a theory that suggests if people do not use public transport more, it is not because it is expensive or because they lack money, but for other even more important reasons, such as, for example, their time. And keep in mind, we are not only talking about travel time on the bus or the subway, but more specifically about transit and waking times. That is, the time we spend going from home to the station and back, and the time that we sit and wait for the bus to arrive, or the time that we spend on our various transfers. But now, let's put some facts on the table. A 2006 meta-study that investigated all the literature to date concluded that these waiting times were, on average, 40 to 100% more expensive than the time spent in private vehicles. Or to put it another way, that when faced with a 20-minute journey by public transport coupled with, say, another 20 minutes of waiting time, citizens preferred to use their private vehicle even if it took more than an hour to make the same journey. Knowing this then, we can safely conclude the following. If the aim is to promote the use of public transport as opposed to private transport, the key is not to make it free, but to improve the services themselves. This means improving the quality and above all, reducing waiting times. So okay, visual economic community, up to this point in the video, we have only seen how free transport does not seem to be able to meet its intended objectives. However, let me tell you that we still have the most interesting part of all. At the beginning of this video, we said that this measure could worsen inflation and even be a burden for families with fewer resources. But how on earth is that possible? Well, listen up. The cost of free. If there is one phrase that practically all economists have as their motto, it is the iconic phrase, nothing is free. Although it is obvious, even if people do not pay directly for public transport tickets, their cost has to be financed in some way, for example, through the taxes that we all pay. To be more specific, and again using the case of Chile as a reference, it was calculated that this massive application of this measure would cost the public coffers close to $950 million. A figure that would amount to approximately 0.4% of Chile's GDP, which is not much, but we have to remember that whatever that figure is, it an additional cost that will have to be offset with taxes. Something that, it needs to be said, depending on the tax system, could mean taking money away from the middle and most vulnerable classes to pay for services for the better off. A regressive measure in every sense of the word. But wait a minute, because I know what many of you are thinking. Come off of it, Grant. If public transport is for the poor, no rich person would benefit from a free pass. What an absurd thing to say. Well, how would you feel if I told you that the data, or at least the data in several European countries, indicates just the opposite? You don't believe me? Well, take a look. As you can see, it is precisely the people with the highest incomes who use public transport the most as a percentage. And let's see, don't get me wrong, it's not that the wealthiest use it because they don't have the means to travel by car, but that they probably use it more because it is also the richest people who live in the center of big cities and therefore have more incentive and more ease using the network. Once again, as you can see, time and ease of travel are more important than money. Now the major problem is not that it may be a regressive measure that harms the poorest via taxes. The really big problem is that if this measure is financed with public debt, then inflation will increase even more. 
more. In other words, more money circulating, more inflation. And even if transportation in general could go down in price, which, as we have already seen, is unlikely, if we do not replace the use of automobiles, what will happen is that with more money circulating, other products will also go up in price. So no, going into debt and spending more does not solve inflation. That's from first grade economics. Now, knowing all this, does what we have seen mean that families with fewer resources should not be helped? Well, no, it doesn't have to be like that. If you really want to help families struggling financially, you can carry out less easy, populist and problematic policies. A good example of this can be found in subsidies linked to income or lower income age groups. For example, in 2015, the regional government of Madrid established a flat rate of 20 euros a month for all young people in Madrid to use public transport. And do you know what the result was? Well, 25% of young people with fewer facilities considerably increased their use of public transport because it was cheaper and middle class younger people took advantage of the voucher to save up to 49% more and thus increase their subsequent consumption of other products or services. So although the Madrid measure may be open to the criticism in other respects, at least it met the objectives that it had set for itself. But once again, at this point, the questions are over to you. Do you still think it is a good idea to offer public transport to everyone for free? What other measures that we have not explained can you think of to encourage its use? Do you agree with the analysis that the most important thing is not the price, but the quality of the service? You can leave us your answer in the comments below. And of course, if you like this video, please like it so we know. Activate the little bell button down there so you don't miss any of the upcoming videos. And subscribe to all of us here at Visual Economic. All the best. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time.